Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be joining the national uh, indaba of the Sand Parks Honorary Rangers uh, this year, to be joining it remotely. Um, I'm privileged to be able to be here to, uh, to chat to you. I've been asked to talk about a, a, a fascinating topic, and that is uh, migration in birds. And what I thought I would do is I'd give some background to this, uh, this amazing phenomenon. Uh, it's a worldwide phenomenon, of course. Um, you know, just by way of introduction uh, to this phenomenon and the concept of migration, what it's all about, different types of migration uh, in birds. And then uh, I'll just focus in on a number of species that uh, occur in South Africa um, uh, that undertake these different types of migration. And hopefully the uh, information that I provide will be interesting and uh, perhaps even fascinating. So I'd like to kick off, but first of all, again, thanks so much for the invitation from the Honorary Rangers to uh, address your national endeavor. And uh, yes, yeah, so I'll be talking about migratory birds uh, in general, and then homing in on a number of interesting aspects relating to birds that migrate uh, to and from and within South Africa. Let's first have a look at the definition of migration. And it's understood in a broad sense to be the seasonal movement of birds at specific times, and these are predictable times of the year. Uh, and then the other aspect is that it is a seasonal movement between breeding and non-breeding areas uh, of particular bird species. So it's the seasonal movement of birds between the areas where they breed and the areas where they don't breed. And I think we can, uh, we can ask the question, well, why do birds migrate? Well, the fact is that because so many birds do migrate, um, there must be a very good reason to do so. And uh, in fact, what birds are doing is they are making the most of one long summer. As I mentioned, migration is seasonal movement between breeding and non-breeding areas. And of course, if birds can get the maximum benefit throughout the year uh, in terms of uh, where they are, in terms of food availability, in terms of environmental conditions, then that's what they'll do. And many, many, many bird species in the world uh, are, sh are known to migrate. And this migration, going on from what I've just said about having one long summer where conditions are most favorable, throughout the year for birds to survive, uh, to breed in, an, in, in, in a forthcoming year, then migration is clearly a highly successful strategy ensuring that species and individuals uh, in fact survive. Okay, if we just look at um, some of the different regions in which birds occur throughout the world, uh, there are temperate regions, and temperate regions are those that are, uh, are um, found in areas where there is a marked seasonal fluctuation in conditions that are favorable for birds to survive, to feed, and indeed to breed. So there's this marked seasonality in temperate regions. And we compare that to tropical regions, which we here in South Africa are, are more um, familiar with. Uh, this is a view of the Shingwezi River up in the Kruger National Park. So I'm sure many of you will, uh, will be aware of, uh, of that view and familiar with it. But in, in, in more tropical regions, um, there is a, a stability that ensures a fairly constant year-round supply of food. So habitat environment is stable throughout the year. And uh, this, in fact, uh, results in this constant supply of food. So food availability is an important factor uh, determining whether birds are going to move or not. I'd just like to give a little bit of a historical perspective on, uh, on migration. Uh, in, the early, in the early years, uh, people were aware of the fact that birds disappeared at certain times of the year, in particular up in the temperate regions. And very often, um, the, the birds would, would mass in flocks before they disappeared. And those flocks very often, such as the, uh, uh, the barn swallow, which I'll be talking about quite a lot, would roost in reed beds in wetland areas. And, uh, 
one evening they would be roosting in in huge numbers in these reed beds and the next morning they'd be gone and this picture shows uh, birds being netted in a wetland area, in a marshy area. And the idea was that these birds went down from the reeds into the mud when it got cold and they, that they spent the, uh, the temperate winter, the northern hemisphere winter, down hibernating or whatever they were doing in the mud. And hence they could um, presumably be trapped in nets. Uh, in these wetland habitats. So that was uh, how people understood, uh, misunderstood um, what birds were doing and how they were behaving from, from, uh, from season to season, particularly when winter set in. Well, we now know um, that birds do move. They perform these seasonal movements between breeding and non-breeding non areas. And these are at predictable times of the year. And there are different types of migration and, and movement, and these uh, are based, the, the terms are based pretty much on the regions that these birds are moving between. And as far as Africa is concerned, we have the, the longest distant migrants are the Palearctic migrants. And these are birds that move between uh, the Palearctic region, which is essentially Europe, and Africa. Um, and an example, I've just put one example, is one of the beautiful roller, beautiful roller species. This is the European roller. And this is just a diagram showing uh, the area from uh, the, the, um, the roots that are followed between the uh, breeding areas of the species, which are those uh, in blue up in the north, um, and then down to the, uh, the, the, the non-breeding areas, which are those um, down in, uh, in, in the southern parts of, uh, of, uh, of Africa. So that's the, um, the uh, European roller. And then the second, so that's Palearctic migration uh, from Europe to Africa. And then we have what is called intra-African, within African migration. And a very good example of this is, I'm sure, a bird that many of us know very, very well, and that is the beautiful African paradise flycatcher. This is a bird that uh, breeds in our summer, and uh, I'm sure many of us are familiar. We might even have them breeding in our gardens during summertime. The photograph here is of a beautiful male with its long orange tail, and it's feeding three chicks uh, in a a stunning little nest that is uh, is a tiny little cup-shaped nest that is constructed often quite conspicuously in the open uh, under the canopy of um, of a tree. And uh, if we have a look at the um, at the migration of this uh, species, it's the picture down at the bottom left showing um, the the migration within Africa. So these birds are moving from the the southern extremity, the southern tip of Africa, they, in, in, uh, and where they'll be breeding in summer, and then they move further north into the central parts of, uh, of Africa. Some of, these some of these individuals, some populations, um, birds do not migrate at all. Uh, I know up in northern Zululand, for instance, um, African paradise flycatchers are resident throughout the year. So that's the intra-African migrants. We have uh, oceanic or pelagic migrants. Um, this is a little bit more fluid because many of, uh, many of the oceanic species, such as this white chin petrel, many of the albatrosses, uh, and, and, uh, yeah, a vast majority of, of pelagic seabird species, so open sea, uh, species breed on offshore islands, many of them down in the southern oceans. And, um, these birds will then will breed on those islands when conditions are favorable, and then they move around um, over vast areas when, uh, when they're not breeding. They also cover vast, uh, vast distances when feeding young on the nest. Um, but this is, I'm not really going to focus much on the oceanic or pelagic uh, migration systems of birds. It's more the terrestrial migration systems that I'm looking at. And then within, um, within our region, we have what is known as altitudinal uh, migration or movement. And an example of a species that does this is the African stone chat. And I'll be talking a little bit more about altitudinal migration with some more examples later on. Essentially, uh, altitudinal migration or movement 
is also seasonal and uh, it involves birds moving from breeding areas at higher altitude uh, in the in the more mountainous areas of uh, of South Africa, such as the Drakensberg and the Sutu. Um, in the summertime, conditions are really favorable. There's a lot of food available. Um, and uh, many birds will be present and breeding at the higher altitude areas. But when conditions um, become colder and and uh, and more harsh during the winter time, mo many of these bird species just move down to lower altitudes in the lower lying areas um, surrounding the mountain areas. And I'll, as I said, I'll talk a little bit more about a, a few species that um, are very good examples of altitudinal migrants uh, or movers later on. Just very briefly, migrants come in many shapes and sizes. Uh, there's, there's an incredible diversity of migrants um, from aerial insectivores such as this little wire-tailed swallow to wading birds, shorebirds as they're also known, such as this ruff. Um, and uh, these birds, you know, swallows, certain swallow species are paleoctic migrants that are coming to us from Europe. Um, most of our swallow species are, are intra-African migrants moving shorter distances. Many of the shorebirds that uh, that um, we get in summertime have come to us from the furthest extremes up in the northern hemisphere, from the tundra regions and sometimes the Arctic Circle, and they come all the way down to the southern tip of Africa, where uh, they they spend uh, the summer feeding on the bounty of food that uh, that is present in our wetland systems, particularly around the uh, around the coastlines. And then we also have uh, raptors, um, smallish raptors, and then medium-sized up to large raptors, such as this European honey buzzard. Um, even some of the larger eagles uh, migrate from, uh, from Europe uh, through, to, uh, through to Southern Africa. And then a number of stork species. Um, Abdom stork is an example of one that is an intra-African migrant. They, 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 they move within Africa up from southern Africa up to uh, to East Africa and up to Ethiopia and places like that. And um, so this is just uh, an indication of the, the, the huge diversity of uh, of different bird species. And then down to the smallest little warblers. Here's a, 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 an extreme warbler singing. And um, these little birds, you know, they weigh around 10 to 15 grams. Uh, they're small little birds, and yet they migrate these many, many thousands of kilometers between breeding and non-breeding sites. Well, how do birds prepare for migration? And uh, one example that I'd like to use is the garden warbler. Um, I think that the uh, while all birds need to prepare for migration, no matter how large they are um, or what type of birds they are, um, this is particularly um, noticeable and interesting in the smallest of our migrants. And uh, the garden warbler, um, probably, you know, when it's, when it's uh, really uh, fattening up for migration. And uh, this is an example, just a diagram showing the, uh, the amount of fat that is deposited by a um, a garden warbler, this one has been, this is for diagrammatic purposes, this bird has been plucked just to show the body. And the, the yellow is the, is, is, is the normal sort of uh, form of the body. And then the pinkish red coloring is the fat that is, uh, that is loaded on in preparation for uh, migration. And uh, I had an interesting example with this particular species. Um, the garden warbler, I, I, I do bird ringing, and I was ringing up in uh, Witsant Nature Reserve uh, up in the, in the Northern Cape. We had a national ringing workshop there, and it was in March. It was in the time when the, when the Paleoctic migrants were, were moving north, preparing for their long migration back to their breeding grounds. And within a space of two days, I caught two, uh, well, yeah, I caught more than two garden warblers, but I caught two individuals in particular. And the one weighed 12 grams and the other weighed uh, 18 grams. And in the hand, um, when I removed these little birds out of the net, you could feel the difference in, in, in the bulk of the, of the birds. The, uh, and the, when you blow the feathers on the, on the, on the, um, on the belly of these birds, you could see, uh, the one that weighed less had very little fat deposited, whereas the heavier one had loads of fat. Uh, so, um, I'm assuming that the lighter colored, uh, the lighter, <laughs> the lighter bird had uh, just arrived from further south and it was going to, 
um, refuel, spend uh, a, a week or two feeding uh, voraciously in the area to uh, you know to to put on the extra fat that it needs to uh, to go further north. Whereas the heavier bird had already been in the area for a while and it was ready to go. So it was fascinating to actually experience that firsthand. So this just shows the uh, the, the, the significant increase in fat deposition that takes place prior to um, uh, to migration, and that fat is the is 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 going to pr produce the energy, the extra energy that these tiny birds need on their on their long migration up to their breeding grounds in the uh, in the northern temperate areas. Another thing that's important is that uh, birds' feathers need to be in very good condition. Um, many of the long distance migrants, these paleoctic migrants, these smaller ones, such as the red backed shrike on the bottom right, and I think this is a willow warbler top left, um, they have, their, their feathers are in, still in good nick after they've bred up in their, up in the northern breeding grounds. And so then they head off for their migration south to, uh, to South Africa with a good set of, uh, of primary feathers, uh, to ensure that they can, um, carry out their flight um, with, uh, you know, um, with, without worrying about feathers being damaged um, during during migration. Once they've arrived, they, however, start to replace those those uh, those flight feathers because, um, yeah, uh, the migration does take a toll on the on the on the keratin, the protein that the feathers are, are made of, and. Um, these pictures show birds that are in the process of replacing uh, their worn feathers. If we have a look at the red backed shrike down on the right, those are all old. The outer wing feathers are, are lighter colored and you can see the tips are worn and these darker colored feathers on the, on the inner part of the wing towards the inner part of the wing are the brand new um, feathers that are, are being produced to replace the older ones. And all of these birds, here's another example in the willow warbler. You can see the older feathers there and the, the newer, darker feathers being produced there. So this is probably, these were probably taken in around December when uh, the, the, the process of renewing those wing feathers is, is well on its way. And by the time that they leave in March or April, all of their uh, wing feathers will have been replaced and they'll have spanking new, uh, strong wing feathers to take them back to uh, their breeding grounds. So they need to have their um, their wings in uh, their, their feathers in very good nick, uh, very good condition, um, so that they don't have any problems um, with flight on their way back to their breeding grounds. Let's uh, talk a little bit now about the duration of migration. How long do birds uh, migrate for? How long are they on migration? And what sort of distances are are covered? Uh, by uh, by these birds, and the example I'd like to use is is a sedge warbler. But of course, the the distances covered and uh, and the duration of migration depends very much on the size of the bird, um, and whether there's a need to stop to refuel. Uh, some birds can travel vast distances without having to stop to refuel, but uh, many others, particularly small birds, need to uh, you know need to refuel every now and then. But the facts. Uh, are, are nevertheless remarkable. Uh, this little bird, the sedge warbler, and you can see in the hand, it's, it's probably about a, a 12 gram bird. Um, but I showed previously a, uh, a, the fat deposition of a, a garden warbler. Um, research has shown that the sedge warbler lays down enough fat reserves to fly nonstop for three to four days over a distance of up to 3,000 kilometers. So that is what it is possible um, of uh, the distances it's possible of flying without having to um, to refuel. Um, birds probably, these little birds probably wouldn't take those risks, um, but they would stop uh, at short, over shorter distances and feed so that they can rebuild the fat reserves that uh, have been used up while flying. But this is the kind of, these are the kind of distances uh, that are possible on the fat reserves that these birds lay down. It's remarkable. If we look at the barn swallow, uh, which again is, a, is about a 20 gram bird, um, these birds cover vast distances between their, non, between their breeding grounds up in, in Northern Europe and, uh, and South Africa, anywhere between nine and 12,000 kilometers in a straight line. And this can take between three to 12 weeks. I'll talk quite a lot more about barn swallows uh, later on during the presentation. 
Uh, a medium-sized wading bird, shorebird, such as the Curdy Sandpiper, um, can travel 7,000 kilometers in total uh, over a period of five to seven weeks. And um, this bird, the Arctic tern, is, is really the champion migrant. Uh, it weighs about 100 grams, and it has the remarkable distinction of traveling probably around 70,000 kilometers on its annual round trip between its Arctic breeding grounds and the Antarctic. Um, where they spend the the southern um, the southern summer, the northern winter. So they travel essentially, you know, up and down um, the from pole to pole, and uh, it's quite remarkable what they are able to achieve. Um, these birds may live for more than thirty years, and if we do the calculation, the lifetime distance that they spend uh, that they that they cover during migration is. Uh, an estimated 2.4 million kilometers. That's three return journeys to the moon, from the Earth to the moon. So it's absolutely remarkable that a 100 gram bird is able to uh, perform this amazing feat. What about the speed with which birds fly when they're on migration? Um, again, using the curly sandpiper, it's a medium sized uh, wader. They fly anywhere between 65 and 80 kilometers an hour. Larger birds, um, they don't use flapping flight, but they are more gliding and soaring, such as the white stork. Um, they, slow, they fly slower at about 50 kilometers an hour. But little birds like uh, the warblers and the Eurasian black cap is one of these. They can fly up to 30 to 40 kilometers an hour. So they really, um, you know, uh, get on with it and, uh, and, and, and cover the distances that they need to cover um, at fairly, fairly fast speeds. What about the altitude at which birds fly? Um, the height above uh, above um, sea level or ground level? Well, using the example of a, a fairly small passerine bird, the red-backed shrike, which is a paleoctic migrant, um, and together with most small birds, they'll be flying at an altitude of, of, uh, of up to about 2,000 meters. So it's up to the height of up to an altitude of two kilometers, but most birds will be flying considerably lower than this. Large birds, such as migrating uh, birds of prey and, and griffin vultures, um, they might go up to nine kilometers above the surface of the earth, 9,000 meters. Um, there are stories of, uh, of vultures and uh, migrating geese and cranes colliding with aircraft at cruising altitude. Um, so uh, some birds might even go higher than 9,000 meters. And of course, they need to um, cross some huge barriers such as the Himalaya mountains and of course they need to get over and above these uh, these large features. Another pertinent question is do birds migrate during the day or do they do this at night time? Uh, are they diurnal or night nocturnal in their migratory habits? And uh, this is a picture of a small flock of ruff but small birds, including smaller birds, including waders, uh, migrate primarily at night. It's safer to do so. Remember that where there are large um, concentrations of birds moving, there will always be predators. And uh, numerous raptor species actually um, uh, are well tuned and in tune with migra migratory systems um, and processes and uh, so it's much safer for smaller birds um, to migrate uh, under the under the cover of darkness. Uh, the other thing as well, the smaller birds need to to rest and also feed during the day. Um, so they would, uh, you know, they would migrate during the night, and then uh, they would, uh, you know, be in areas where they'd uh, be safer during the day, where they can also rest and and feed and uh, recharge their batteries and refuel and uh, you know, pick up uh, food so that they can lay down further fat reserves to continue with their migration. Uh, that would include birds such as these small warblers. So um, it's incredible. Um, there's a, there's an, um, a place in the mountains, a place called Ngulia in Kenya, where uh, there are, there's annual ringing activity that takes place during the migration, um, during the migration time. Uh, of birds coming from uh, the Paleoctic region down into Africa. And uh, Ngulia is f at a fairly high altitude. And 
often there are misty nights and what the ringers do is they put up mist nets at night with spotlights and during these uh, frequent misty conditions where it's essentially just low cloud over the mountain areas this causes the birds to um, to come to land and uh, and not to be flying because conditions are fairly hazardous when uh, when there's cloud and um, and uh, many of these small birds uh, are then trapped in these nets and um, they're fitted with rings and all the necessary measurements and and, uh, and weights are taken and uh, so it's just an indication that birds are moving at night but if the conditions are not good they're grounded and they'll come down um, and they're also attracted to the lights at Angulia. So um, it just, um, the ringing activity there makes use of this phenomenon of nocturnal migration of uh, many, many passerine birds. Larger birds such as pelicans, birds of prey, storks, cranes, um, they migrate during the day. Of course, being heavier, they rely on uh, thermals on, on warm air currents rising off the earth um, to assist them with their flight, with their soaring and gliding flight. And um, they're also not that prone to predation. Um, so generally speaking, larger species will migrate during the day and, uh, and will rest at night. I just want to talk very briefly about um, uh, certain flyways and the hazards associated with these flyways. If we look at the Paleoctic African migration system, and this is just represented diagrammatically here, the arrows show um, the paths that are taken by many, many millions of migrating birds. And um, you will see that most of these um, are concentrated over land masses. In, on the eastern side here, you will see birds coming from the eastern part of Europe, um, going across the, uh, the, um, the Middle East, and only crossing the, the Red Sea to get down into to East Africa and Southern Africa. And then on the western side, uh, many of the flyways come across um, uh, the land masses of Portugal and Spain, um, across the Straits of Gibraltar, um, which is just a very small um, area of, uh, of open sea that the, the birds would need to fly over, and then they're into North and West Africa. Certain species, however, do um, sort of island hop. They come straight over the Mediterranean Sea, making use of um, Italy, Sicily, other islands such as Crete and Malta. Um, but then they have these large um, expanses of open water in the Mediterranean that they must cross. And of course, a huge uh, um, um, risk area for many migrating species, particularly smaller birds, is the vast uh, expanses of the Sahara Desert in North Africa. So here's just a, a, a wonderful satellite image showing uh, the Mediterranean, and uh, and here is the Suez Canal. Uh, this is is probably the massive delta uh, in Egypt, but it just shows uh, quite graphically some of the, the hazards that migrating birds, uh, you know, need to navigate. And to the east will be uh, will be the Middle East, the the land masses, and there are vast numbers of birds that channel through uh, the the Middle Eastern countries on on both spring and autumn migration. As I mentioned, uh, large masses of desert, large areas of desert, pose a very real threat, particularly to smaller passerines, small songbirds, um, especially if they've crossed the Mediterranean. So they've just crossed this huge area of open ocean uh, and, uh, and then they have the, the dry desert. And birds will concentrate on oases in, in the desert where there's water and shelter and uh, hopefully there's food as well. And um, they'll spend a bit of time there before moving further south. Mountains also pose significant um, uh, barriers and obstacles to migrating birds, um, so that many of the birds will seek out um, passes, uh, you know, that take them over the lower altitude um, parts of these mountains, such as the Alps. And um, but the larger birds will generally just go straight over the top at high altitude. So these are very real hazards, and of course. 
temperatures can be very low uh, at, uh, at at high altitude over these uh, these mountain ranges. Um, this is just a, a, a picture of a, a bird that has has got lost. This is a little Balon's crake. This is somewhere in Europe, and uh, it's behaving very uh, unusually for one of these uh, skulking little species, um, but providing a wonderful opportunity for people to to uh, have a close look at what is usually a secretive species. But birds are thrown off course, and uh, we have many examples of this each year here in, in South Africa, um, with birds being thrown off course. Uh, the recent um, uh, um, huge storm systems in the Mozambique Channel were a case in point where we had sooty turns, which are pelagic turns, normally out way out in the Mozambique Channel. And we had numbers of these species coming into, you know, parts of South Africa, way inland, northwest province, uh, lots of them in Mpumalanga. We even had a frigate bird in the Free State. And these are also normally birds that uh, are out, um, you know, out way out in the sea in the Mozambique uh, Channel and in, in, in the Indian Ocean. So um, uh, environmental conditions must be right. It, it helps to have tailwinds if they have headwinds. Um, you know, that they need to battle against birds or really struggle uh, with that. And another one of the huge hazards um, is, of course, hunting. And many Palearctic migrants uh, have to uh, run the gauntlet of hunters' guns in parts of North Africa and uh, parts of the Mediterranean, some of the islands in the Mediterranean, and some of the Mediterranean countries, as well as further north into Europe, as they migrate both down on the on the autumn migration and back on the spring migration. I want to talk a little bit about how we study bird migration, and uh, the first uh, way of doing this is just by observation. And an example I'm going to use is not uh, not part of our African uh, situation, but it's a very good example of of uh, how observations of birds moving through areas um, reported by bird watchers um, aid in um, understanding the uh, the bird migration processes. And the example I want to show here is the ruby-throated hummingbird. Now these are tiny little nectar feeding birds um, that migrate, and that's just one feeding. They, they of course hover and they have very high metabolic rates. They feed almost exclusively on nectar. And um, this just shows um, the eastern part of, well, the, the, the United States of America. And these little birds um, migrate south to the Gulf states, um, south of the Gulf states into Central America and South America, across the, the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, in the non-breeding season, that's where they go to. And then they migrate back into the, uh, into the United States to breed. And um, what this sh shows here in the spring of 2002, they asked birders to report the first sightings of these tiny little hummingbirds. And, um, and the different colored dots that are shown here are, are um, an indication of the different months in which these birds were sighted, um, going from uh, you know, from, from March, February and March, lower down all the way through to May as we go further north. And so this is just an indica indication of how observers can, uh, through observation, can plot the rate of movement of a particular species over an area. Uh, the um, method of bird ringing uh, is, is used widely throughout the world to study bird migration. And um, this usually involves putting up very fine mesh, uh, nylon mesh nets in areas where birds congregate, such as roosting sites. This is uh, in a reed bed um, to, uh, you know, to uh, aimed at um, capturing swallows, migrating swallows and warblers. And uh, the birds get caught in the very fine mesh of the net. This is a little sedge warbler and then um, uh, qualified and, and highly trained uh, bird ringers then extract them carefully from the nets, being, caref being very, very careful not to injure them. And then using uh, various tools, uh, these tiny little, um, um, usually aluminium rings, so very lightweight rings, each numbered individually, 
uh, are then fitted with uh, with ringing pliers onto the legs or leg of individual birds. And here's an example of a, a barn swallow, um, which has been ringed. This is a bird that we caught here in Bloemfontein, and you can see the little aluminium ring uh, on the leg there. And um, it doesn't uh, impede the bird in any way if it's fitted correctly. And, uh, and the birds are released after they've had their various measurements taken and had a ring added to, uh, fitted to their legs. The first ringing studies took place in Denmark in, in 1890 and uh, common starlings were ringed uh, with, um, with really basic rings but also very lightweight metal rings. And um, this was the first time that this uh, method was used to study the movements of a bird species. Uh, radar is also used um, particularly to track um, migrating large groups of migrating birds and uh, this has been used for many many years um, depending on on what it is what questions are wanting to be answered uh, radar can can be a good method to use um, larger species have been um, for some time have been fitted with radio tracking devices and uh, then by using triangulation with a number of masts to uh, to track the uh, the signals um, that are, are emitted uh, uh, emitted by the the radio transmitters. It's possible through triangulation to track where um, the routes that that individual birds are using. Uh, this uh, works very well with large birds because of the relative uh, mass of the radio tracking device. It doesn't need to be that light. Uh, it must be a, um, only a small percentage of of the bird's mass. And um, but in recent years, small tracking devices have been uh, developed that can be fitted to birds such as as small as the blue tit, which is a, a very small European bird that probably weighs about 10 grams, 8 to 10 grams. So it's remarkable in the, the uh, advances in technology. So um, even small birds are able to be uh, radio tracked. Um, the the, some of the most recent advances in technology include satellite tracking of birds and a number of species are have been fitted with satellite tracking devices. Um, one example is a greater spotted eagle uh, and birds have been um, tracked from their breeding grounds uh, in Poland um, all the way down to uh, to their non-breeding grounds in uh, in East Africa. And uh, we also have examples of birds that are used, we use um, uh, satellite tagging devices for secretary birds. There are a number of projects on at the moment tracking uh, secretary birds in, in, in South and Southern Africa, various vulture species to see exactly where they are moving um, to and from so that we get an idea of how best we can uh, conserve these species. Here's an example of a white stalk fitted with a satellite tagging device and uh, just um, there were some birds that had these fitted down uh, in the Western Cape, and these just show uh, the results of the uh, the, the, the tracking uh, of those birds. This is one particular bird, and this is an example of uh, both the southward and northward migration of white storks. Um, this these results possible made possible um, through. The, uh, the satellite tagging devices that uh, have been fitted to a number of birds. An interesting example of this was uh, locally was also um, the African penguins after the treasure oil spill uh, back in uh, in 2000. Um, some uh, some of you may remember the story. We were we were really worried. The um, conservation authorities were very concerned about um, the African penguin populations, particularly around the breeding colonies of Dasson Island and Robben Island uh, off the west coast, close to where the treasure ship uh, went down and uh, there was that terrible oiling um, uh, incident. And what they decided to do to give, it, um, to give the authorities a bit of time to start clearing up the oil is they caught uh, numbers of African penguins and relocated them to Port Elizabeth and released the birds there. The idea being that it would take them quite a while to swim back to their breeding 
uh, colonies on these offshore islands that were affected by the oil. And so this map just shows some of the spots um, uh, where three penguins uh, that were fitted with satellite uh, um, devices. Um, it just shows the locali locations of these. And uh, the penguins were named Peter, Pamela, and Percy. And then this shows much better the routes that were taken from uh, where these birds are released in Port Elizabeth, near Port Elizabeth, back to uh, Dasson Island and, and, and Robin Island. Um, all three of them made it, made it safely back. And it was a, it was a huge success story because if these three made it back successfully. And, uh, this was at the time, it was, uh, it was, it was quite advanced technology and, and it was almost, uh, um, available to the general public in real time. So you could actually watch how these birds were proceeding, uh, with their journeys home. So it was, uh, really quite, uh, you know, you know, quite, uh, a technological advancement to be able to see this. More recently, um, geolocators have been used, and these are small um, devices that can be attached to uh, birds, and these birds don't have to be that big. And the geolocators have light sensor light sensors, and um, depending on uh, the position of the sun um, and and the light intensity, um, this light intensity is measured, and it's possible to uh, then plot the roots of the birds uh, that are wearing um, these geolocators. And this is just an example of gray-headed albatross um, using the geolocators to plot the movements of these birds around the, uh, the Southern Oceans. I've already mentioned the Arctic Tern as being arguably the, uh, the champion migrant. And uh, uh, just a reminder of that slide with the information. Um, but what's interesting is that some, some very, really, really good data has been collected using geolocators on Arctic terns. And um, this just shows the migration in green and yellow. Um, green is the post-breeding migration and yellow is the, uh, is, is the returning migration to the breeding grounds. And the, the red shows the, um, uh, the movements of Arctic terns, uh, you know, during the interim period. So it's fascinating what information can be gleaned from this technology. Okay, let's move then to um, you know, closer to home and particularly to, to talking a little bit about uh, migrants that we might be familiar with in South Africa. The total number of bird species recorded in South Africa, and this is not Southern Africa, South Africa within the borders, boundaries of South Africa is about 865 species currently. And um, there are about 90 species that are Paleoctic migrants. So these long distance migrants between the Paleoctic region and, and Africa. And intra-African migrants number about 60 species. Um, some of these traveling uh, longer distances than others. And then we have around about 10 species that show this phenomenon of altitudinal migration or movement. And just some examples, this is the European honey buzzard, one of the Paleoctic migrants. The greatest striped swallow is a species that I'm sure many of us are familiar with. They build the mud nests with the tunnel often on under the porch of our houses or, uh, you know, in uh, outbuildings and things like that. And then uh, this is just an example of an altitudinal migrant, a bush black cap one of our endemic uh, babbler-like, bulbul-like species, a, um, a bird that is found in our forests. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, some of these, of these species now. Uh, firstly, again, just more examples of Paleoctic uh, migrants, the common or step buzzard. Uh, in summertime, these are very common, on, particularly on, on telephone poles along, uh, along gravel roads and, and, and the and more um, rural areas. Lesser grey shrikes together with redback shrikes are very common Paleoctic migrants um, appearing in savannah and woodland areas during, uh, during the summer. One example um, that I would like to uh, talk about uh, is the bar-tailed godwit. This is one of the larger wader species and this is arguably the long distance record holder for non-stop migration. Um, and the example that I'm going to talk about is uh, not 
doesn't involve South Africa, even though I've said we're talking about, you know, birds that we're familiar with here, but, uh, it might well be that Bartel Godwits that come down from, uh, from the Paleoctic region down to South Africa, um, do similar things, uh, that they travel similar distances and have similar, similarly remarkable feats of migration, uh, as that which I'm going to speak about. Now, uh, recent research has shown um, birds um, leaving, uh, and, and this is in the in the Pacific Ocean now. These are birds that are migrating from New Zealand um, back to Alaska, um, where they breed. And uh, it's research has shown that these birds leave New Zealand in about mid to late March each year. And the uh, research has shown that these birds fly directly from New Zealand to Eastern Asia. So without stopping, and that's a distance of around 10,200 kilometers. And these birds then leave Asia for the breeding grounds in Alaska during May. So they'll stop over and refuel in Eastern Asia in these estuaries before traveling the 7,400 kilometers, odd kilometers to their breeding grounds in Alaska. And after breeding, they refuel on the coast of southwestern Alaska before undertaking what is a remarkable journey. They return to New Zealand non-stop, flying a straight line distance of 11,000, almost 12,000 kilometers across the ocean. And they do this in a period of seven to nine days during September to mid-October. Isn't that remarkable? And the illustration uh, diagram shows it there. So one particular Bartel Godwit, a female, in three flights flew almost 30,000 kilometers. And uh, each of these three flights were nonstop flights. But the longest um, was almost 12,000 flights nonstop, um, which the, a particular bird can fly in anywhere between seven and nine days without stopping to refuel. That's quite remarkable. And, and another couple of interesting stories, um, we have um, some small uh, raptors, small falcons uh, called Amma falcons that uh, breed up in the Amma region in northeastern Russia, and hence the name Amma. They uh, breed along the, uh, the Amma River up in northeastern Russia, and then they migrate down to, uh, to South Africa during the non-breeding season. They head south and southwest down um, via India, um, and then they head directly across the, um, the Indian Ocean and uh, straight across the ocean nonstop, and they make landfall in East Africa and around Kenya, and then they come down, uh, you know, overland down East Africa into South Africa. But what's particularly interesting is that this is a, um, it's a, it's, it's a fairly strange route to be following. And recent research has shown that um, they make use of this route because of prevailing weather conditions. And another important reason could well be because uh, many, many tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of a single dragonfly species are following the same migration route over the Indian Ocean. And that's this dragonfly, which is the pantalo or the wandering glider. So it might well be that not only is it the prevailing weather conditions that are favorable for um, the Amma falcons to, to move both, um, you know, uh, in their, uh, after breeding across the Indian Ocean, but when they're heading back, they are going in the opposite direction across from Africa to India. And uh, at both of these times, the, the wind conditions are, are good to provide tailwinds to uh, accelerate their, their flight and to enable them to fly over these open expanses of ocean. But the other th important thing is that these dragonflies are in the area also moving at the same time and essentially providing food for the migrating falcons. So they don't need to uh, land anywhere. They can just feed while they're flying. So it's a fascinating story and um, there's quite a bit of research uh, on the go at the moment. And um, this is just a, an illustration taken from a site which documents the research showing the migration route of the Amma falcons, as you can see, 
And then there's the area of the Indian Ocean that they cover. And it also shows the movement of these dragonflies, the pantalas, and just giving some of the areas in which these, uh, you know, these dragonflies are also found, some of these oceanic islands at the time. So it's a fascinating story and uh, one that has come to light uh, fairly recently. Just showing the, uh, the, the climatic conditions, the monsoons and the wind systems that uh, enable these, uh, these organisms, these birds and these insects to make use of, uh, of these ocean crossings. Another interesting example of an intra-African migrant is the little African reed warbler. This is a, a species that is, is very common in summer in, uh, in reed beds around dams and water bodies. And uh, just to show uh, from ringing studies, this was um, an individual bird that was caught. Uh, I did, uh, we did ringing close to Bloemfontein. It was caught in October of 1997. And it was re-trapped in uh, three years later in uh, October of 2000, and then a year later in October of 2001. And one of these birds uh, that had been ringed at this same locality outside Bloemfontein was re-trapped in outside Hamaroni in Botswana, and then the following season it was re-trapped at the same site back again in Bloemfontein. Just showing this that these birds um, are, are, you know, how they move, and um, and where they are moving to. So just a fascinating uh, study showing it wasn't so much a study as much as just ringing results, showing an individual bird um, being able to track it between Bloemfontein and Botswana and back to Bloemfontein again. But this particular individual had undertaken its, um, a, a similar journey somewhere up into into Africa. Um, over three, almost four consecutive uh, years, which you can see there. And then I just want to uh, talk very briefly at the end just about a fascinating uh, thing that has been picked up, and it, it, uh, it combines two, uh, two interests that I have. One is migration that we'll be talking about because it involves a migratory species, but the other is it involves um, uh, vocalization and vocal behavior, and particularly the mimicry of another species and other species of birds. So this little bird shown here is a chestnut vented warbler, or um, um, a tit babbler as it used to be called, and they have beautiful songs, but they also incorporate songs and calls of other species in their vocal repertoire. And what's interesting is that a number of people in different parts of South Africa have noticed that uh, around about this time of the year, in about August, September, the chestnut vented warblers often incorporate the calls of Diedrich cuckoos into their vocal repertoire. That's only happening now. Um, and what's interesting is that the Diedrich cuckoo is, an, is a migrant. It's an intra-African migrant. And they, uh, they call, um, uh, you know, uh, almost continuously when they do arrive. And, but they only arrive in, uh, usually in about October. So, uh, what's fascinating is that, um, Diedrich cuckoos do parasitize. Uh, they lay the eggs in the nests of many species, but including chestnut vented warblers. But um, uh, this just this scenario and the behavior of the chestnut vented warbler in uh, uh, is it preempting the arrival of the Diedrich cuckoos by mimicking their songs uh, and their calls before the cuckoos actually arrive? Is it a preemptive warning to uh, to to other chestnut vented warblers just uh, as if to say, watch out, remember the cuckoos are coming, you need to be on the ball? Or what is it about? But it's a fascinating story that, as I said, just combines two of my, my keen interests, one being migration of the Diedrich cuckoo and the timing thereof, and of course, of vocal behavior and mimicry of, uh, um, of, the, of the cuckoo by the chestnut ventured warbler. So just a little aside to the story on migration. I'd just like to acknowledge uh, a number of inst um, institutions and uh, photographers who very kindly allowed me to use their photographs. Uh, in this presentation, and uh, thank you very much for your time, and um, uh, thank you for your attention and for being there to listen. Thanks so much. All the best.